Welcome to The Liberated Life. Get ready to free your mind, body, and spirit in business and pleasure. Now here's your host, Robin Quinn Keen. Hi, this is Robin Keen, and welcome to The Liberated Life. Set yourself free in business and pleasure. And today I have the honor of having my dear friend and my mentor, Neil Moore, with us. Neil, welcome to The Liberated Life. It's really great to have you here. Thanks, Robin. Always great to see you. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to touch base with you today and speak to your community. Thank you. Neil is a really special person to me. I met Neil, gosh, I think it was in 2003. I had been teaching traditional piano lessons and I'd been teaching kinder music. And what I found is I brought students out of kinder music, which was joyful participation. That was the premise of it where they'd been together in groups and they'd been having so much fun around music. And then they came to me, they moved into private traditional piano lessons. And it was like watching a balloon deflate. (laughs) It wasn't usually a pop. It was a slow, this slow deflation into what I'm by myself and I'm not having so much fun and there's nobody to share this with. And I went on a major hunt for a different way to teach piano. And I found Simply Music, the method that Neil is the creator of, I found it because someone else recommended it to me, another kinder music teacher. And you know, sometimes when you know, you know. And I just absolutely knew this is what I'd been looking for. I played by ear growing up and really had to find it within me to learn how to read music. And I wanted to equip my students with that ability to experience music rather than have this really slow, effortful experience of playing. I just wanted them to play the way I'd been able to do it. And Neil had this beautiful method where you play first and you read music later. And the whole experience of joy is what I was aiming for. And boy, did did I get it. And my students, they really had that experience too. So I got to teach in groups and they got to have this joyful experience of making music together and playing first, that's a completely different experience. So Neil was my coach because he taught me how to do this. He became a dear friend and a mentor, not just around music, a life mentor. I have a lot of deep gratitude and respect for Neil. So Neil is going to talk about music and creativity. I really believe that freedom of expression is so critical. A lot of that's been through directly through my experience of playing the piano and making music with that introduction neil that's your big introduction (laughs) let's jump in and and talk about music and self-expression and creativity and the real freedom that comes that way yeah well thanks robin thanks for your kind words i appreciate that yeah it's um it's an interesting thing because there are there are so many layers to the conversation about the about the world of music and what it contributes and for me part of the starting point in the conversation is is looking at you know where are we at as a culture with with regards to music and the role that it plays in people's lives and the impact that it has and that's a challenging conversation to have in some respects because we find that many of the many of the older cultures uh, have used music and and have music integrated into the fabric of the structure of their lives. It's not taught formally like it is in more developed nations. And it's interesting to see that in those countries that have far less or no focus on formal music education, typically in those cultures, music plays a tremendously important role. And it's used as a means of being able to communicate life lessons and morals and ethics and standards and uh, it's used uh, as as a way of communal uh, expression of suffering and pain and joy and celebration. It's fascinating to see that. And yet, when we look at more developed nations, where we've come to understand that music is this extraordinary com- complex science and a math, and in order for people to be able to get their head around and their hands into musicianship, we've developed systems of education and th- those systems have largely been in place for you know around 300 years and the fascinating thing about it is that in my view the fundamental charter 
of music education. Like the point of music education is to equip the population with the ability to be musically self-expressed. And yet here we are with a system that's been pred predominant now for around 300 years. And it's like, well, how are we doing in our fundamental charter? And the truth of the matter is that really it's only a fraction of a percentage of the population that have any real ease and facility with musicianship and have access to that means of self-expression and creativity. And one of the symptoms of our system, which has excluded so many people, is that it's given birth to this a series of myths. And so what's very prevalent in our culture is the myth that, well, some people are creative, some people are musical and others aren't, which is just, it's so profoundly mistaken. <laughs> You know, we, we've come to believe that, uh, you know, musical self-expression is only available to a select few people. And we tend to think in terms of, you know, I'm, I am a creative or I'm not a creative. And part of what it is that underscores everything that I do with Simply Music is first and foremost, we need to utterly dispel this bizarre notion that some people are musical and some people aren't. So for me, first and foremost, it's critical that we understand that every single human being, without exception, is profoundly musical. That changes the whole dynamic if people actually believe they're musical. But so often it happens very early on. You and I both worked with Lynn Kleiner, who specializes in early childhood music education. Yeah. And I remember Lynn saying that what happens even with babies is we devalue their babbling and singing and we go straight for rewarding them with attention when they speak words. So when they're babies, they sing, right? They naturally sing. They go, ba, ba, la, la, whatever they do, but they babble singing tonally. But mom and dad are waiting for them to say mama and bye-bye and dada. And so instead of singing back to them when they're little, echoing back the little notes that they sing, we ask them, can you say mama? Bye-bye. And, and then we get excited when they do that. So instead of acknowledging their musical expressions, we wait for something that makes more sense to us. So I believe it begins at a very, very young stage without our recognizing it. Yes. And so even at the beginning, we are devaluing music and valuing spoken mm -hmm. expression. So yeah. I, you know, with my experience with Lynn, I started having that awareness. Uh, and so I think it begins then. And then I think it comes up again as we grow up and people say, oh, you're really not that good at that. Or you should really do this instead. Those early explorations of music are just completely innocent expressions of, you know, curiosity, I think. And, and critical. How do you break down all of the years of uh, segregation, really, in terms of, you know, you're musical and you're not. You should be studying an instrument, but not you. You should go in a different direction. Or, wow, you are so amazing. You need to become, <clears throat> oh, that, that's another piece, right? So for those students who show great promise, the the creative investigation ends and the demand for technique and perfection and performance, yes. performance suddenly excellence. takes over. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, look, there's a, there's a couple of aspects to that. And uh, it really depends on which end of the telescope that you look down. So, you know, the, when regardless of the, of the enormity of the failure rate, and when I say the failure rate, you know, you know I've, I've been around music education for decades. I've personally trained thousands of music educators. Uh, I'm very uh, engaged in dialogue with music educators on a constant basis, um, both from with inside my own organization as well as outside. Uh, we're dealing with an intake of students 
all the time, many, many of whom talk about their prior experience and the consistent messages, how grueling it was or how difficult it was, you know, what a struggle it was. Uh, for many people, it's an experience, you know, where they carry a lot of bruising. Uh, in many uh, instances, it, it was a scarring experience for them. And so there's an aspect of that where people have come to believe that they're not musical, yet they still want, they still value music. In, in spite of the high failure rate, culturally, we still regard music learning as a very good thing. Although we tend to think of it still as sort of like an, an optional subject. Um, and that's something else I'd like to touch on if we get an opportunity to, uh, to address Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. From, from uh, our point of view, uh, I think that it's very easy when you're working on an individual basis to be able to interact with people in a way that begins to dismantle these myths. So, you know, for that person who believes they're not musical, you know, there are all sorts of examples that we can surface and represent and communicate to people about how musical they are. I'm of the view that we are all so musical that, that we're oblivious to it because it's such a, a, a part of who we are. We don't tend to think of the fact that when, you know, if you and I are walking down the street together and we've, we're engrossed in a conversation about anything and we're engaged in that back and forth dialogue, for the most part, we're oblivious to the fact that even though we're fully engaged in that conversation, in the background, you know, we're walking and our feet are just maintaining this beautiful left, right, left, right. So we could engage in a conversation and even though I'm having this conversation now, it has no disruption whatsoever to this beautiful, smooth, natural, even rhythm of our walking. Mm -hmm. People right. are aware of the fact that that's profound musical self-expression. Right. You know, when we're at a concert and we're applauding, we're not conscious of the fact as to how beautifully smooth and even and natural that, uh, that rhythmical expression is. And there is example after example after example of this happening all day for everybody because that musicality underscores all of our sort of physical functioning. And then we have the person who says, well, you know, that might be true for everybody else, but, you know, I haven't got a musical bone in my body. And I love it when people say that. And it's interesting how often people say it using those exact words. I haven't got a musical bone in my body. Here's the thing about that. When somebody communicates that, it is real for them. It's true. It's, it's a belief system that they hold. <laughs> However, one of the th amazing things about human beings is that we can't hold on to a belief Mm -hmm. But you can provide somebody with an experience that has them experience that that belief is not true. The, the belief itself just dissipates. It, mm -hmm. it, and so at the simplest of level, when that person says, look, I haven't got a musical bone in my body, I love that. And I say, look, what you're trying to do now, you're trying to communicate to me that you haven't got a musical bone in your body. And I'd like you to just stop for a moment and listen to what you're saying. But let's not focus on the actual words. I want you to just listen for a moment to the rhythm of what you're saying. You just said, I haven't got a musical bone in my body. I haven't got a musical bone in my body. Da 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 da. I haven't got a musical bone in my body. Da 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 da. It's this incredibly complex rhythm. Mm -hmm. So when we just break it down, if we were to look at just speech, which comes so naturally and visibly into us, it's like we weren't even aware of how we acquired speech. We just know at some point of time in our life, we're just speaking and communicating fully. But what we're oblivious to is that this is an extraordinarily complex composition of musical concepts of rhythm and pitch and intonation and variation. It's extraordinary. So the reality of the situation is, is that if you are walking and you are talking, you are demonstrating mastery over complex musical concepts. And I'm of the view that what we need to do is we need to look and say, well, how do we take that musicality that underscores the being of human being and be able to direct it into the hands, into musical self-expression? Mm -hmm. And then that, of course, opens up new possibilities of, well, how do we go about doing that? Because the reality of it is that the formal approach, <clears throat> that technical theoretical approach that you spoke of earlier, mm -hmm. accesses the brain one particular way, but it's really not the way that the brain connects with its natural musicality. The brain, by design, is a pattern-seeking device. Mm -hmm. So what happens in our world is that 
we teach music by having people be able to see music in terms of shapes and patterns. It accesses the brain very, very differently. It's very homogenous to the way that the, the brain is structured. It uses neural pathways that are most organic and, and natural for the brain. And it allows for people to immediately connect with their natural musicianship. And the bottom line being that I want people playing more quickly and naturally and easily and has them playing more music and a higher quality of music than uh, anything that we've been able to achieve using traditional approaches. The tagline that you have used for years is a world where everyone plays. I absolutely love that because in teaching <clears throat> music for the past 17 years or so, out of all of the students I've had, and I've had over a thousand, I only had two that, that couldn't, couldn't get it. And one was a gentleman who had suffered a significant stroke. And his wife was just hoping that this would put him back together again. And it didn't because it was too significant. But we also had a young guy that had been injured in Afghanistan who it absolutely did. He couldn't remember our names when he came back from Afghanistan. And he'd been at our studio learning Simply Music and then he couldn't even remember our names. And after about eight months of working with us, back to what you were just talking about, the patterns, the neural connections, the pathways, it was remarkable. He actually remembered our names and then he ended up getting married and going on to live a very normal life and we couldn't believe it. Hmm. But it's not only accesses the musicality that we have, that's true, and it also strengthens what we have. I believe yes, it, it actually builds a stronger brain. I've wondered, you know, mm. I've wondered about him in particular. <clears throat> thought, wow, how remarkable. So if it's helping someone who's actually got a brain injury, imagine what it's doing for those of us who don't, who have strong brains to begin with. The way we approach simply music, the way we approach music to be not only freeing and empowering and enabling, but it's also in many ways therapeutic. I find... Yeah, well, that's the thing about it, that separate from the fact that we're all musical, when we look at what are being engaged in musical uh, education and musical self-expression does, playing music and creating music, it, it involves practically every part of the brain. So whereas speech <clears throat> resides in a particular part of the brain mm -hmm. or even socialization or balance or our memory or, you know, smell and taste in their regions of you know, whether, you know, they occupy a particular region of the brain, M music, unlike that, dominates the brain. Mm -hmm. So uh, just listening to music, that involves the, the subcortical structures like the cochlear nuclei, the brainstem, the cerebellum. Then what happens is, you know, in listening, it moves up into the auditory corticals on both sides of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, it involves the memory centers of the brain, the hippocampus, the, the lower parts of the frontal lobe. You know, as we move to music or even as we're moving in uh, expression of music, uh, it's getting the cerebellum involved. If we're reading music or if we're actually, you know, looking at what we're playing, that's involving the visual cortex. Uh, if mm -hmm. we're working with songs that involve lyrics, it's in, involving the language centers in the temporal and the frontal lobes. Performing music uh, activates the frontal lobe as well as the, as the motor and sensory uh, cortex. And it requires that co coordination of motor control and uh, somatosensory touch and auditory information. It improves, improves the ability for auditory imagery. It's extraordinary the extent to which music learning impacts the brain. And that's where it comes down to what I think is the critical thing here, particularly when we think of, of, of liberation and freedom. And to me, one of the crucial pathways to that comes down to creative capability. Mm -hmm. And I'm of the view that as you know, we're, we're facing such a unique time in this era where we're all witnessing this arrival of the technological tsunami. Mm -hmm. And we know with what's coming down the pipeline that it's going to re redesign the experience of what it means to be human. We're seeing things change, transform at a speed and a breadth that's breathtaking. Industries are being transformed instead of uh, you know, uh, it taking generations mm -hmm. or even decades. We're seeing industries transform in a year or two.
yes. been completely revolutionized and it's created such a culture of uncertainty. In fact, quite likely, the only thing that we can predict about the future with certainty, say in the next 10 years, with certainty is we've got no idea what it's going to look like. <laughs> right. I'm of the view, I'm yeah. of the view that the, the critical currency of the future won't be cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum. It won't, that's not the critical currency. The critical currency of the future is creativity. Mm -hmm. And more so than ever before, there's, there is such a deep need for us to be able to bring access to creative capability. And in doing that, we, I, I believe we need to understand creativity from a, a different perspective. If I can just say a few words about that. Regardless of your profession, your occupation, regardless of it's in, whether it's in our parenting, whether it's in our relationships, whether it's in our entrepreneurial endeavours, our ability to recognise opportunity and see op opportunity where others may not see that opportunity, the ability to recognise that comes out of our creative capability. It's one thing to recognise an opportunity, but to then materialise that and to look and see how am I going to make that happen? How am I going to, where am I going to assemble the resources from? How am I going to do that? And we're always facing that, those questions for ourselves. How am I going to fix this? How am I going to address that? Our ability to be able to, to address materialising something comes out of our creative capability. And as we proceed in, in that pathway in life, we come up against obstacles and hurdles and issues and problems. And so we're looking at how do I solve this problem? How do I address this? How do I fix this? How do I amend this? How do I improve this? Whatever the case may be. Our ability to be able to resolve problems and ideally not merely resolve them, but, but resolve them in a way that creates new openings and, and possibilities, that comes out of our creative capability. And so for me, given that, Creativity is going to be the critical currency of the future. Given that right now, our ability to be able to recognise opportunities comes out of our creative capability. Our ability to materialise that comes out of our creative capability. Our ability to resolve the issues and hurdles along the way comes out of our creative capability. Then I think it's time that we ask the question and seriously contemplate what activity are we going to consciously weave into the fabric of our life that's specifically designed to nurture and nourish our creative capability. And music learning does that, impacts the brain more so than any activity, any engagement in any other form of art or sport. So for me, music is no longer merely a form of entertainment, which is wonderful, but it's way more than that. It's no longer something that we look at it as being, well, it would be good discipline, which is wonderful, but it's way more than that. It's no longer, we are far beyond seeing music as just being a nice, engaging, social thing to share, all of which is true. We're talking about here of giving people the means of being able to access and express something that is right at the core of their humanity, right at the core of being human, that's going to impact and develop their creative capability in a way that's not only going to allow them to con continue to function in this new future, but that's going to support them in flourishing in that new future. In other words, the introduction and the engagement in music education provides, as a bottom line, absolutely critical neurological nutrition for anybody at any age. And for this reason, I think that it's that the time has come really for us to engage in the discussion of, you know, what I would call music and the new case for creativity. I love that, Neil. And I have wondered for myself, even as uh, in the last 10 years, like who would I have been had I not had such a musical foundation in my life? I'm a pretty creative person. I call myself a possibilitarian because that's how I look at life, all the possibilities. And I actually had a friend say to me, I wonder who you would be if you hadn't had all that music. Yes. And I wonder that for my own children. I wonder that for many people, like what are they doing to foster the creativity within? And you and I have talked about how many high level entrepreneurs and coaches and people in the world have all of these different disciplines or 
rituals that they participate in on a daily basis. They have a, you know, a meditation ritual and a exercise and an eating and whatever, all these things. But one of the things they have not considered is a creative endeavor. And I really believe it's just critical to our, to our joy, to our expression. It's an important part of relaxation. And given that we allow ourselves to be creative on an instrument and not have to follow a bunch of rules all the time, that creative exploration that happens, I really believe everything you're saying. And I understand that it's going to be more and more critical as we move along on the timeline of this century. What do we do creativity in them? I honestly, in the moment with the advances in technology, I talk a lot with parents about being present because I think parents are less and less present. My impression is they're less and less present as technology advances and we're handing babies devices when they're really little, right? And that is not, that's that's receptive stuff. That's not generative mm. learning. And you and I've talked about, and we talk about in the Simply Music Piano Program, developing generative skills. That's so critical that we know how to generate things on our own, not always taking things in. And one of the ways I've explained that to my students is if I asked you to go home and read a book, that's receptive. I can certainly go home and read a book. If I asked you to go home and write a book, that's generative. That's output. That's your own creation of words and sentences and concepts. That's what we're talking about is your own generation of music, not just receptive, but generative. Yeah, that's really, a, it's a great point, Robin. And and it's also an important thing to distinguish uh, from, uh, as I see it, that there's such a massive difference between having what people would consider to be a creative outlet. I'm specifically talking about what we're learning about the brain and the impact uh, on the brain that the specifics of music learning provide is unique. And so in some respects, I think of it like even though, even though we might eat well, we mm -hmm. still see that there's a need for supplementation. Right. Or even though we might have time where we relax, we still understand now, but no, it's really important that we have sleep. Or even though we may have active lives, we still see, no, it's important that I work out. Mm -hmm. So we have the expression of that particular thing, and then we have this additional activity that, that's specifically designed to enhance that expression. And that's really where I see that music education is critically important, not just from the point of view of that we enjoy music or we listen to music or we've got these other outlets of expression, because we could really say, say that all the things we do have an aspect of creativity to them. But I'm saying nothing impacts the brain in the same way that music learning does. Mm, I understand. It takes us to that next level if it's not just the learning of music, it's the way that you learn music that is critically important. Because we do know that, you know, our traditional methods, which, you know, have produced, uh, you know, a world of brilliant and incredible musicians, that, that is true. It's, it's also excluded the vast majority of the population. And if we're going to actually contribute to causing a breakthrough in creativity for humanity, we need to transform our approach, our educational approach. Because whilst traditional methods have been wonderful in traditional times, we are far, far removed from traditional times. And what's needed is music for the new era. And so from that point of view, whilst music can be explained mathematically, it doesn't belong there. Music, right. Musicality belongs to the design of who we are as, as a species. And there is a way and a means of being able to access that, to connect with that, to expand that, to develop that, and turn it into musical self-expression immediately. Mm -hmm. So I'm wanting a world where people can, you know, someone can start learning today and they're playing today or tomorrow. They start this week, they're playing next week. Yes. You know, in a month's time, they've got a repertoire and six, 12 months down the track, they've got this huge repertoire of 30, 40, 50 pieces of music when they're playing contemporary and classical and gospel and blues and they're doing arrangements and accompanying and improvising and composing like a really comprehensive um, experience of broad-based musicianship. And that's available to people immediately. Start today, start this week, be playing next week. Rather than this notion that we've got that it sort of takes years. Well, that's 
Now that that's not that's not a problem of the of the person. That's a methodological problem. The way yeah. that we've taught it has been the barrier of entry. Yes, absolutely. And for those of you listening to this today, thinking, "Oh, that you know, come on, that's not possible." Well, I'm telling you, 17 years later, it's 100 percent possible. That is the way this method works. It's it's magical in some ways. It's just remarkable. If you're a parent of a child, you'll be you'll just sit there and think, you've got to be kidding me. My child is doing what? They're playing this already. If you're an adult who's tried piano before and not completed what you had hoped, or it was really difficult and you're finally ready to get back to it, and you're worried that it's going to be what it was, this is not the piano lessons you grew up with. This is immediate access to your own creative expression. And I love that about it. And I love the long-term impact for students too. I may have shared with you, Neil, that my youngest daughter graduated from high school a couple of weeks ago. There were 200 kids in her class. There were at least a hundred that I have had in lessons or had in my studio. And those kids are so capable and so confident. At the same time, I ran into several of my previous students at the graduation, you know, they've just completed college and, you know, degrees in like engineering and biotech and law. And I just think, wow, these kids that went through the Simply Music program in its entirety or close, they have just become such capable, confident, creative, wonderful people. I I just... I see these announcements on Facebook and I think, wow, look at that. And their parents have even come back to me and said, I attribute a lot of my kids' success to the experience they had and how they expressed themselves musically, what they learned and how they connected the dots and the things that happened in their brains that just set them up for success. And I really believe that it it can't be a happenstance. It's too often to say, oh, you know, great coincidence. No, it's over and over again. Tell me, Neil, how do people access the Simply Music program? What are the ways that they can connect with what you're doing? Because whether they're parents of young children, adults, seniors, people who have a concern about their brain health, I mean, this program really addresses all of those specific needs. And Mm. so how do we how do we find the Simply Music program? Our main website is simplymusic.com. We've, for most of Simply Music's history, we've been sort of unidivisional, one one division, and that has been a, a teacher training program, training teachers how to teach. And so if people wanted, if the general public, you know, wanted to, to learn our program, they'd need to be in contact with the teacher. And so on our website, you can find out about the teacher training program, or you can, uh, if you're wanting to learn, you can uh, find out about what it means to be a student and then connect with the teacher. But a couple of years ago, as we saw the need for, well, you know, we have three and a half billion people online at the moment in the world. In the next five to seven years, we'll be bringing on three and a half billion people for the Mm -hmm. first time. We'll go from three and a half to seven billion. That in and of itself is going to change Mm. You know, the global economy and we're going to suddenly have billions of people contributing new um, ideas and thought processes etc cetera, etc cetera. but we also have people that are going to want to have access to all of those wonderful things that we all have access to with internet connectivity and i also saw the need for us to be able to provide world-class education at no cost and so we have developed a self-study program it's not a it's not an upsell it's not a gimmick it's there's no credit card or anything like that required it is world-class education at no cost you can also find out about that um, it's our self-study program so that's when you go into simply music there's sort of three areas there's the teacher program learning with the teacher or our self-study program so if someone was interested and my advice with regards to that is how to look at this is to just look at it like it's one of the like just as you supplement and you have the small dose of supplements that that um, contribute to your diet or just as you have you know the workout that contributes to your overall physical health even if you were to just treat this as a supplement and see it as being critical neurological nutrition as well as all of the other benefits of self-expression that you're going to get from that even if you were to just find 15 minutes a day and do that on a consistent basis you'd be playing great sounding music uh, immediately connecting to your natural musicianship developing this whole new voice of self-expression as well as in the background knowing that you are really impacting all the areas of your brain 
that are, that are going to have a massive impact on contributing to your creative capability. That's wonderful, Neil. I love thinking of your music as a part of your just your daily routine. It's just what you do because it contributes so much to your to your entire experience of life, really. It yeah. impacts so, so much of life. That's wonderful. So I would really encourage anyone who's interested to go look at the Simply Music website and see where you might fit in. I've been uh, running a bunch of masterminds this uh, spring. We always give a tip, like what is a best practice or tip you can give during the pandemic? I've continued to say one of the best things you can do for yourself is go take up some music, learn to play. And I've sent a lot of people to Simply Music because I really believe that it might be fun and it might make you feel good, but wow, like the the other effects that it's having on you that you can't even tangibly put your finger on right now, right. It, there are some huge impacts that it's having on your very brain. It's really critical that we're taking care of ourselves, especially right now. Exactly that. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about that today. You are very welcome. My pleasure. Neil, thank you so much for spending the time with us. I'd love to have you on again to talk more about brain health because you are a student of the brain and psychology. And that's one of one of the very cool things about you is I've always thought that you were a student of the human being. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we've had many conversations and very enlightening conversations about um, human beings not human doing, but human beings. So I'd love to have you come back and talk about that with us sometime. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you to my listeners. And you can find all the information about Mm -hmm. Neil and the link to the website, simplymusic.com in today's notes. Thank you for being here at The Liberated Life. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, listeners. Good to spend time with you today. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more great information at quittingculture.com.